this is your first time listening to our podcast, welcome. Our programming brings a diversity of voices connected to Myanmar to share their perspectives, thoughts, and reflections about what has been happening there since the military coup in 2021. All of our guests share one thing in common, a deep personal stake in the ongoing crisis. And it is an honor for us to be able to bring their voices into your earbuds. But however difficult it may be to hear some of their stories, we hope that you will come away with a deeper and more nuanced understanding of what is happening there. Welcome back. One recurring theme of conflict around the world is that as the story grows, individual groups and communities often get overlooked. And unfortunately, Myanmar is seeing this repeat itself again and again and again, in particular with regard to the Rohingya community. And that's what we're going to be talking about today in a reasonably fast paced and condensed uh, interview. So we're not going to waste any time. Let's just jump into it. My guest today is Dan Sullivan. Dan, would you like to uh, introduce yourself for the audience? Yes, thank you. Um, pleasure to be with you. Um, my name is Dan Sullivan. I'm the director for Africa, Asia, and the Middle East at Refugees International. We're a um, U.S.-based um, av independent advocacy group, um, a little bit unique because we don't take any government uh, funding and we don't have operations on the ground in um, different refugee settings. So that allows us to be a little bit more independent. Um, and I've been working on um, human rights and atrocity prevention and refugee issues for uh, over 20 years. Um, a large bulk of that has been focused on uh, the Rohingya. And uh, so I'm happy to be have the chance to talk about that with you today. All right, thank you very much for being here with us. I know this is a very important topic and one that sort of comes into the media and then falls out of media focus and then suddenly reappears and 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 people are often are just not aware of how long this crisis has been going on and how continuous the crisis is. The media representation is is a patchwork, almost like a series of smaller crises, but it, this is a significantly larger um, issue. So can you can you sort of walk us through the history of let's say from roughly from independence? Um, the the relationship that the Rohingya have had with the with the broader Myanmar uh, state. Sure. Yeah, you can go. I mean, you can go back um, uh, many many decades um, previous to independence uh, to the first time that the the Rohingya um, you know are recorded and shown to be in um, the western part of Myanmar um, in what's known as Rakhine State. Um, but they have, um, you know, historically been uh, marginalized. Um, they stood out from um, um, the vast majority of other uh, groups in Myanmar, largely because of their religion. They are they are mostly Muslim, um, and uh, whereas uh, most of the other people in Myanmar are Buddhist, um, and so they're, you know, while while they they were part of society, um, and I've I've met Rohingya who had served in parliament. Um, for the most part, they were really um, discriminated against. They come from a part of the country where there are other groups, uh, inclu including the Rakhine, who have um, also been marginalized. And um, there's been a mixed history there where, um, you know, the, the Rakhine and the Rohingya have worked together, but also um, of community tensions. And you've had um, different groups that have, have exploited that um, and so that, yeah, that's kind of kind of the history of where it was, which led right up to, um, you know, the 
uh, after the military you know, ruling for, for a number of years, uh, there was an, a democratic opening where Aung San Suu Kyi was uh, released from house arrest and allowed to run for parliament. Um, this is around 2010, 2012, and we saw some um, what was first kind of communal violence between Rakhine and Rohingya break out, which initially displaced over 100,000 Rohingya. Um, many of them remain in, in uh, displacement camps in Rakhine State. Um, but then we saw a, a real um, uptick in, in the uh, attacks on the Rohingya in August of 2017 when, um, when the Myanmar military uh, had just blanket attacks across, uh, across Rakhine State against the Rohingya, leading uh, more than 700,000 of them to flee into Bangladesh, where they remain in, in what is now the largest um, refugee settlement in the world. Um, and then now we fast forward a little bit to uh, two years ago when the Myanmar military um, carried out a coup, um, which has um, you know, set the, the country on, on fire um, and uh, makes it very unlikely that the Rohingya will be able to safely return anytime soon. So, th I mean, there's a lot there. We, we've opened quite a lot of uh, doors and I think, it, I think it's worth uh, wandering into those just to examine them a little bit more deeply. So <clears throat> the one thing that I think is important to clarify is that a lot of texts for historical reasons are going to use the term Arakan, um, either for the region or for the ethnic group, uh, which is largely used interchangeably with Rakhine today. But so the Rakhine or Arakan people, um, where, where do they sort of fit with this? Because they're not, they don't identify as Bama and they're not aligned to to the Burmese military. Uh, and in fact, they've been in conflict with the Burmese military, but they also seem to have a seething hatred of, of the Rohingya population. Is there, is there any particular um, relationship or any particular history between those groups? Sure. Um, you know, I touched on that uh, briefly, but it's, uh, you know, it's a complicated history where um, there are, you know, years where they worked and traded together in Rakhine State or Arakan State. Um, but there have also been, uh, there's also been a history of tensions, which, um, you know, it's, a, it's slightly overgeneralized, but I think um, the, what it comes down to most basically is the, the religion aspect where, um, you know, where the, the Rohingya are, are seen by the Rakhine as, uh, as outsiders, um, many, many in, in, in Myanmar, um, Burma, and uh, particularly among the Rakhine see them as uh, what they call them as Bengalis, you know, coming from across the border in Bangladesh. Um, and so they, they see the, the different um, religion and this, uh, this narrative, um, this false narrative that they, you know, they're not, you know, from that, uh, that area um, and that they're uh, foreigners that are coming in. And then we saw there, you know, that's been stoked further by uh, a group of um, Buddhist nationalist extremists, uh, Bauman uh, extremists, who um, like the you know somewhat infamous um, monk Wiratu, um, who you know stoked this narrative that the Rohingya are an existential threat to everything that's good about mm. uh, the the Bauman culture, about Buddhism. Um, and, and just really um, expanded that to a whole narrative of, of a crescent of Muslim uh, countries and populations taking over and that, you know, really depicted the Rohingya as the front line for them. And so uh, a lot of uh, dehumanizing language um, and, uh, and threats and things that, uh, um, you know, helped to lead up to a, a real boiling point between the two groups. So I want, I want to just take a step back there because there's something that you that you specifically mentioned the false narrative that they are outsiders and so the, Ro the Rohingya people uh, as an ethnic group they they live um, for, for those who are not as geographically sort of familiar with it they live towards that northwestern part of Rakhine state which borders Bangladesh um, their their skin color is darker their physical features resemble uh, those that we would see in the Indian subcontinent. And not only are they Muslim, as the majority of people in Bangladesh are, but also the language they speak is an Indo-European language that is related to the languages that we find in the Indian subcontinent. So taking this into consideration, we could maybe understand where this narrative that, oh, they're, they're Bangladeshi immigrants comes from. Um, but what's, what's the actual truth of the matter here? What's, what's the history here? 
Yeah, as you said, there's um, there's um, the the language is an affinity with the um, the Chittagonian dialect in, in in Bangladesh, just across the border, um, and there's that religious um, uh, you know. Uh, the, the same religion going on, but it, this is a part of the world, you know, that saw a lot of movements of people over several, you know, several centuries. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, while you could go back hundreds and hundreds of years and say, well, they, the Rohingya weren't there at that time. Um, they've been there as long as many of the other groups that have uh, come through um, and certainly have been there since, uh, since Burma's independence. Um, so, uh, there's yes, there's a history of, of different groups moving, and and, and there's uh, a reason why they um, have have the language and kind of culture and religion that they have. Um, but you know, this is this is the the kind of the way modern borders have been drawn, and it's more about uh, in in the recent decades, where despite the fact that Rohingya have been in that uh, that area for um, at least a hundred years, um, that there's this. Narrative that, uh, unlike others, um, particularly those who are, are Buddhist or Bauman, they're they're not um, seen as being um, you know citizens of Myanmar. And there was even a um, in in, in uh, 1981, I believe it was a, a citizenship law which identified um, over a hundred ethnic groups that were considered to be citizens of of Myanmar, and the the Rohingya were left out at that time, mm. although they had been well established. Um, so that's once again, was just like the, a result of that narrative, uh, rather than the, the looking at the real facts. And, and that I, I'm glad that you brought that one up. Because the fact of the matter is, if, if you examine the citizenship uh, law that was passed, it doesn't just enumerate, uh, you know, the 135 identified uh, ethnic groups, it actually lays a, a framework. Myanmar, for, for those who are not familiar, Myanmar actually has um, a multi-tiered citizenship system. You, you have naturalized citizens and you have associate citizens and you have all these sorts of things and different colored ID cards. And it's not just a simple dichotomy between inside and outside, but the actual framework that was presented was a framework based on the history of the presence of a group of people within the contemporary borders of Myanmar, regardless of what that territory was considered to be in history, groups that are native to specific territories that are currently within the contemporary Myanmar borders and were already present by a certain uh, date were automatically considered to be um, citizens of Myanmar. The Rohingya have passed that metric. The Rohingya can prove archaeologically presence in what is today Myanmar territory in Rakhine state. And yet, despite this, they were deliberately uh, excluded, even though they've met the metric that the citizenship law itself um, proposed. And, and I, I wonder if you could you could broaden this. I've heard many uh, allegations. I've heard many stories of Rohingya um, basically just having their citizenship denied or their citizenship revoked after it had already been granted. Again, for those who are not aware, uh, citizenship documentation has to be up, updated periodically in Myanmar at, at specific uh, years of age, you have to go back and you have to um, fill out the paperwork again and, and have the documentation reissued. And so there are people who are issued documentation at say 18 years old, and then uh, some years later when they had to reissue the documentation, they were denied. Um, so we've we've heard very widespread rumors of, of or allegations of a campaign by the apparatus of the state to deny the Rohingya any attempt to apply for citizenship and to revoke citizenships once those citizenships have even been um, guaranteed or, or provided. Uh, and I wonder if you can you can uh, tell us anything about that particular uh, phenomenon going on. Sure. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole history of different kinds of identity kind of documents. Um, there was the, the so-called white cards and uh, different things that um, kind of proved uh, Rohingya citizenship or at least gave them uh, some their, their Rohingya identity because that's it goes beyond just denying that Rohingya are not citizens to uh, claims that the Rohingya just don't exist as a people. They're illegal Bengalis. They're not. There is no Rohingya. That is the argument. Um, there's a really good um, uh, kind of history of this at the uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and they have a um, an online exhibit as well. So, um, you know, for anyone really interested in getting diving deeply into that, they have these these various um, documents um, and, and ID uh, ID markers that um, over the years have been changed. And 
Um, but again, it, it, it goes to that and it also goes to now you have the dynamic um, that we've seen in other parts of the world when people are forced to flee en masse very rapidly. Um, you know, a lot of people now don't have certain documents and that that will complicate uh, any future uh, repatriation, you know, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll get to a point eventually where um, this isn't a, you know, a, a, a country that's terrorized by the military um, and that um, a more inclusive uh, government comes into, into uh, power. But it's going to create uh, problems in the future, too, because people don't have all those, uh, those kind of uh, documentations. Absolutely. And, and so speaking of fleeing, uh, like we're, we're about to talk about, obviously, the, the 2017 um, genocide. But there were, I believe, already significant numbers of Rohingya refugees living uh, across the border in Bangladesh prior to uh, that genocide. How how bad was the scale of of the refugee crisis at that point? Yeah, so I've been um, traveling and visiting those uh, camps in Bangladesh since before the um, the, uh, the the genocide that occurred in August 2017, and there were already, um, you know, estimates. Esti estimates ranged um, because uh, not all uh, Rohingya were registered. In fact, um, Bangladesh is not a um, not has is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention. Uh, they did allow the UN Refugee Agency um, to register about uh, thirty thousand. Um, refugees. Um, this is going back to um, the early 1990s. So there's there have been other waves in the past of um, of uh, attacks on the Rohingya, which caused them mm. to go across to Bangladesh. But so prior to the uh, mass exodus um, in um, 2017, there were probably about 300,000, of which uh, some 30,000 were registered with the UN Refugee Agency. And a lot of those lived in these these camps, um, and you know, at that time it was not uh, not great conditions. But um, particularly the ones who were registered had some access to education or livelihoods. Um, there were a lot of the same kind of uh, concerns you see with other places, uh, other refugee settings, where uh, some restrictions on rights and, and things like that. But it's um, it's gotten um, it's gotten a lot worse, just both both in terms of scale, because uh, after um, after August 2017, you had another 700,000 plus. Um, so that the total is is around a million uh, refugees there now. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead in the conversation, but uh, but the conditions yeah. over the past five years, um, as this this has become uh, now what the U.N. defines as a protracted crisis, have also uh, de deteriorated in, in, in several ways. And, and absolutely. So let, let's let's sort of jump forward because this narrative of the false false migrants uh, or, or the illegal migrants thing, um, which like this is a narrative that we see played out everywhere in the world. Like we we see groups that one part of society wants to eliminate often characterized as not having a right to a, a specific place, characterized as unlawful subsequent waves of migrants. Uh, and it's it's just a very easy way to dehumanize people. But the extent of this in Yama is is big. I, I remember a few years back I was talking to a journalist, friend of mine, uh, who who wrote about um, the report that Amnesty International prepared about the Rohingya, and under uh, Section sixty six D of the Communications Act. And for those who are not familiar with it, sixty six D basically guarantees uh, limitless uh, censorship capabilities to the central government in any um, published media. Uh, they they were rejected twice. And in the second rejection, they were simply told point blank, the word Rohingya cannot appear in the reporting. They have to be referred to as as illegal uh, Muslim migrants. And, and I think it's worth talking about in 2012, uh, so 2010, there's the election, Thane Sain's pseudo civilian government comes into power. 2012, Thane Sain announces that he has a plan to send the Rohingya to Bangladesh. Um, and we see... Uh, Ashin Wiratu, who subsequently becomes this nationalist uh, leader of, of Mabata, this this violent nationalist Bama Buddhist uh, gang, uh, back then uh, joining the the 969 movement in response and pushing for for the exodus of the Rohingya. Um, so what was the what was the tipping point where this stopped being a uh, Rakhine people don't like the Rohingya people and started being Myanmar views them as an existential crisis. What what triggered that? 
Yeah, it's uh, you know it's a good point. I remember I. I if I remember correctly, Teng Sein actually um, approached the UN or sent a letter uh, requesting their their help in, in sending the, the Rohingya back to uh, to Bangladesh um, at, or back, as he he described it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, part of it was the um, was that democratic opening, right? And there was uh, you know the the military had less of an iron grip, or at least they had left the the outright blatant uh, use of use of cracking down and force to sort of take off their uniforms, but remain in power um, under that setting. So, you know, I, I think it's important to, to stress that was not a, um, that was no um, kind of perfect uh, setup. You know, there was, uh, the military still had a, um, a veto over any mm. changes to the constitution. Um, so, but, but they were, they had, they were more operating behind the scenes. Um, so that opened up the ability for, uh, actors like Wiratu to, um, you know, to to uh, carry out this this um, this negative uh, nar narrative and to scapegoat Rohingya, and that's it, it went beyond the Rohingya as well to all Muslims across the country. We had, um, you know, there were some some really um, egregious attacks in um, in central Myanmar as well, and um, there was a real worry at the time that this would continue to escalate. Um, but I think uh, there were there were various efforts done that that helped to tamp down the outright um, targeting of Muslims across the country. But um, but the the Rohingya continued to be um, a um, an easy scapegoat and, and something that uh, the the Buddhist extremist nationalists um, targeted, and then um, that uh, the Rakhine targeted, and that other groups um, kind of. Uh, you know, fed into the narrative uh, at that time, and even even groups that had been attacked by the military or, and and persecuted um, felt you know. And I remember traveling to um, Kachin State and visiting um, displaced people there, and they just they really just saw the Rohingya was it was something on the other side of the country was not something they were familiar with or or uh, that they empathized with. Um, so I think they were more than willing to go along with the the false and, and negative narrative. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, yeah, so I think that's what kind of uh, opened up um, uh, the rising um, uh, targeting of, of Rohingya that we saw, you know, in 2012 and then um, escalating mm -hmm. through um, to 2017. And so, so 2017 crisis, um, <clears throat> not, not necessarily focusing too heavily on the atrocities themselves, uh, because they are very, very extensive and, and we don't have uh, that much time. But let's focus on the end result. Like this is a this is a genocide. This has been recognized by the United States as one of the fortunately few instances of genocide in modern human history. Um, and we see, I, I believe, more than a million refugees from Myanmar now living in, in Bangladesh in, in what you said was the largest uh, refugee uh, encampment in the world. Um, so what is what is the net result of that? Because it, it feels like yesterday almost, but but it was actually quite like five years ago um, that that was happening. And um, time has passed, but those refugees are still stuck there, and the conditions are pretty bad. So what is what is the end result for the victims of this uh, of this atrocity, and what what is life like for them now? Yeah, well, if if I can just for a moment, just um, before jumping ahead of, of that, I mean, you're right. It, it's it's been well documented and recognized, but I think it is worth just taking a moment to, to just uh, you know recognize the extent of mm -hmm. of the uh, violence that happened. And um, I was in the camps a couple weeks after that exodus started, and just saw the people streaming across, and remember talking to people, and and it was just a kind of eerie. Um, sense of uh, of of how of consistency in the stories uh, that you would hear from different people about um, soldiers surrounding villages setting them on fire um, shooting at people as they fled you know shooting them in the back and this was just so widespread that you know um it, it, you know you ended up having like i said over over 700,000 people fleeing across to bangladesh and and it wasn't recognized right away as genocide um and that's something that um uh, Refugees International and, and other groups, we we led a campaign um, in the United States called Call It Genocide 
um, where we we worked with legal and human rights experts uh, to send letters to, and, and have petitions signed and um, held various events with celebrities and things like that to try to keep up the pressure first on the Trump administration and then on the uh, the Biden administration. Um, and some of the people who went into the Biden administration had signed those letters, people like Samantha Power. Um, and it, it continued to take a big push. Um, so uh, we're, we're really glad that finally um, the United States did recognize for what it is, for what was uh, doc well documented by the, um, the UN fact-finding mission that looked into this and by several other groups. Um, so I just wanted to touch on that. And, um, you know, the, and, and the struggle continues to address um, the, the accountability and other, other aspects of this. But to your, to your question about where, where we are today, where all of this uh, brought us, um, you know, I've, I've been, as I said, I've been visiting the camps from before, from right after, and then over the, over the last five years at different times um, and seeing sort of the progression and talking to um, Rohingya refugees, some of the same ones, some of, of others and, and humanitarians working with them. Um, and, you know, the, what you've really seen is um, a, there was a, a, a real emergency at the beginning, um, a really rough conditions and difficulties with coordination. Um, five years later, five plus years later, um, a lot of that's been addressed in terms of the coordination, in terms of on the surface, right? You see uh, there had been huge deforestation because people were taking whatever they could to burn fires. Um, there's been replanting and greening of the camps. You see like uh, on, the, on the rooftops, there's gardens and um, they're using uh, liquid gas and, and different things so that uh, things can be re revived. The, the roads have been um, have been uh, reinforced, you know, with drainage so um, that you still have damage from um, from the rains. But uh, there's there's a little bit better uh, ability for aid to continue to get in. Uh, so you've seen that on the surface, but what you see underneath when you talk to the Rohingya refugees is there really is this uh, growing sense of despair and hopelessness. Um, and, you know, in talking to uh, a, a health worker who focuses on uh, mental trauma and talked about how at the very beginning, what they were seeing was the immediate trauma of what people had seen in, in fleeing and being attacked, shifting now to this more longer term trauma of, of sense of like, no future, right? They don't. They don't see how they can go back, especially since the um, the coup by the by the military. Um, but they also see um, restrictions uh, increasing within the camps in Bangladesh, where they have not had access to quality education or or any education for a while. Uh, it was just the the local, you know, um, communities that were um, in, in the, the Rohingya that were trying to provide education or access to livelihood opportunities. So. A real sense of not having that future. And then the other major thing that has changed is the insecurity in the camps has really increased, um, I'd say, especially over the past year. But there's, um, you know, a, a, a murky network of, of different groups. You know, there's the group ARSA, which is a Rohingya militant extremist group. Um, there's rival factions. Um, and there are criminal elements that are, are um, you know, since well before the, the Rohingya were there, there've been, um, uh, that's been a corridor for, for drug trade. And so we're seeing um, more and more, particularly um, local Rohingya camp leaders, the so-called Majis that have been attacked and killed over the past uh, year. And, and then also prominent uh, civil society leaders. So a real tamping down on the ability for them to speak out and um, growing fear that adds to that sense of um, hopelessness. And I'm, I'm actually curious about this. I, I don't know whether you, you can really speak to this. It's not directly related, but the, the conflict, I mean, the, the genocide happened notionally under the watch of a of a theoretically democratic government this was under the the nld controlled uh government and in power from 2016 to 2021 and th this has been obviously debated to the nth degree but i'm wondering how how did the rohingya view that government did they have hope that if the if the nld controlled uh, pseudo democratic government continues that there would be a pathway for for repatriation because you you say they they feel quite negative um and despondent following the military coup, which is quite understandable. 
But were they holding out hope that political winds would change? Or were they basically assuming that as long as, as things remain as they are in Yamal, they'll never be able to return? Yeah, it's a good question. I, you know, I, I, I can't speak for the, I don't know what the majority or of, of Rohingya were, were, have felt, but I can just say different conversations I've had over the years. I think there has been, at least for some, there's been a, a shift um, where there was hope um, that uh, the NLD and others would, would help um, to bring them back. But uh, there was a, you know, I think that turned into disillusionment, um, particularly when Aung San Suu Kyi went to The Hague um, to mm -hmm. defend um, the military and the government uh, by extension of um, against uh, the charges of genocide that were brought at the International Court of Justice. Um, so I think, but I, I think certainly they, they see um, the, the remnants of the, uh, what you could say of the, of the um, former quasi-civilian government and particularly the, um, you know, the, uh, the national unity government that's been set up, uh, you know, I think they do see hope. And uh, one of the major thing, shifts that happened after the coup is that we saw various groups um, within Myanmar starting to um, express some empathy for the Rohingya, you know, for the first time kind of saying, seeing the, the military for what it was and, um, and, and seeing that, you know, all these things we heard about the Rohingya, we're seeing them now, or seeing some aspect of them right now where the military is uh, attacking, um, you know, any citizens who, who, um, who uh, stand up and say that, you know, this, they, they're in favor of democracy um, and, and let alone the, uh, the uh, minority ethnic, other minority ethnic groups that, um, that have been persecuted by the military. And so we've seen with the, uh, the national unity government at the NUG that they've, they put out um, a pretty progressive um, policy on the Rohingya um, and, uh, so that's that is encouraging. I mean, I think we need to continue to see uh, push that you know push the NUG and others um, in in the opposition to make sure that they're inclusive and and um, and do uh, back up the Rohingya. So if if hopefully one you know one day um, in the not too distant future um, the military uh, is replaced by a a more inclusive government that that includes uh, the Rohingya and. A path for them to return um, as citizens with uh, with the, uh, the accompanying rights. Mm. And another element of this that we often sort of overlook, like we focus heavily on the the Myanmar component of the crisis, but the the place where the Rohingya have have found themselves uh, largely seems to be around Cox Bazaar, and Cox Bazaar is not only a major tourist attraction in Bangladesh, but uh, just you know, looking it up on Wikipedia, the population, the permanent population of Cox Bazaar seems to be hovering around the 300 and something thousand mark, whereas the Rohingya uh, refugee population is multiples uh, of that number. Um, what, is, what has the impact been on the Bangladeshi uh, state and the Bangladeshi people from this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been massive. Um, you know, I, I talked about the, uh, the massive kind of deforestation that happened in, in that area. Um, you know, the, the UN, um, uh, UNDP development program put out a, a, a study on kind of what the effects of, on the, on the labor market, on the, on, um, you know, on the schools where initially some of the schools were being used to store, um, to store uh, supplies to for the humanitarian um, work, and so it's it has had a, a massive effect. Um, and you know, I don't want to downplay it all the the huge role that uh, Bangladesh and the Bangladeshi people played in welcoming uh, and providing refuge to the Rohingya, um, and and that is something I think is very ingrained in the humanitarian response. If you look at the humanitarian response plan year to year. Uh, there is a section of that talks about the host community, um, and so there is there is a lot of effort being into to recognize that. Um, where the problem is is where uh, there's there's some restrictions that are unnecessarily being put on the Rohingya, mm -hmm. and, and that are adding to this this sense of hopelessness I talked about. And I think that on the positive side that that there have been some shifts and some openings. There is now a Myanmar curriculum pr program that the, the Bangladeshi government has rolled out with UNICEF that is uh, expanding to, um, you know, the majority of, of, uh, of children in the camps now have access to that. 
the problem is it's, uh, you know, when you talk to the Rohingya themselves, the, the quality of that education is still, uh, there's a lot, a lot to be done. Um, and at the same time that that's rolled out, the government's cracked down on some of the home-based private uh, efforts done by the Rohingya uh, community themselves, uh, rather than trying to tap into that um, that network and, and bring them in, bring them into this uh, this effort. So uh, too often we're seeing that sort of one step forward, two steps back, and uh, same thing with um, movement towards allowing livelihoods. There's there's no formal allowing of, of uh, Rohingya to work. There are, um, but there are some uh, there's some ability of uh, volunteers to work with humanitarian groups. Um, and to receive stipend, stipends, um, and same with teachers. Um, but again, it's not it's it's not a, not enough, and then it doesn't uh, it's not something that's available to enough people. So you've got that mix of mix of things where there is it's good to see there is an opening, there is some recognition that you know this is five plus years. You, it's not in the interest of Bangladesh or anyone to have uh, you know this idle, uh, desperate population. They they need to see some kind of hope and. Uh, be empowered to um, to uh, you know work towards a future where they're educated or have um, job opportunities. So um, that's the that's really the the crux of things um, right now. And but as I said, the the host community uh, has been largely affected and absolutely needs to continue to be a part of mm-hmm. the overall response. Absolutely. And so let's let's look at the the contemporary situation. So this is. This is as close as you can get to the analogy of a rock in a hard place. Um, the the conditions that the Rohingya are suffering currently in Bangladesh are, are poor, although as you say, there is some ray of hope, but on the whole, they are poor. And for reasons that are to a degree understandable, the host community is, is um, growing quite weary of the situation. Myanmar is not a safe place for them to return to. and as far as internal politics are concerned, um, the Arakan army have remained neutral in the ongoing conflict. And although they've made overtures uh, towards reconciliation with the Rohingya, uh, very few people are taking those seriously. So the Rohingya don't really have much of a tenable situation. They can't really sustainably stay where they are currently, and they don't have an immediate pathway to return to their their homes in Myanmar. So many of them are, are trying to get out and and get away and can you can you talk to us about um what we're seeing in the news reported basically as a boat crisis yeah absolutely and this is something that um you know that we've been covering and um you know we we recently did a um a virtual event where we featured a um a a rohingya uh, in the camps who had a sister who was on one of the boats and a niece um who thankfully after after several weeks uh, did make it eventually safely to indonesia um, and then some other experts uh, from from the region to talk about this because um, you know as as the UN Refugee Agency had recently reported last year there was a huge spike in the number of people leaving the camps by boat and and leaving Myanmar as well. There's you know people are leaving from both places Rohingya and they um, they estimate at at least and these these are just the numbers that they can try to guess so it's probably higher that 3,500 uh, Rohingya took to the boats last year. And of those, at least uh, around 350 uh, died uh, on those journeys. Um, and, you know, so this is, the, we've seen this as, um, as you said, the, a big driver of this has been the conditions both in the camps um, and this sense of, of desperation. And then in, um, in Myanmar, uh, the, you know, con- the conditions there under the coup, also driving people to, to seek um, other places where they, they hope they can have a better life, um, but yeah, there's there was a big uptick in that in the end of the end of 2022, and that has continued into 2023. Um, and so there's a yeah, there's a real need for um, the region um, to uh, to figure out how to uh, respond to this. Uh, and it's it's unfortunately it's not a it's not a new phenomenon. Um, it, it's it certainly has spiked um, for the the highest uh, numbers. Uh, last year, since probably 2015, when we saw, um, you know, the, there was a, a, another boat crisis uh, where uh, a crackdown on some of the trafficking networks led them to traffickers to abandon uh, boats at sea, and, and there were thousands of both Rohingya and Bangladeshis that were stranded at sea, and that led regional leaders um, to come together and try to think of um, 
think of some some solutions and they actually did put out some um you know some good ideas about creating a, a regional task force and creating uh making sure that there was safe uh disembarkation points um that there was supposed to be a trust fund to help uh deal with these uh, emergencies um unfortunately uh you know none of that really came uh, came together. And so we're, we're back to where we are now where we're seeing, um, these large numbers of people taking to see, um, either, you know, many of them dying on those voyages and even those who make it ashore are either, mm. well, either countries are either pushing them back out, uh, to sea so that another country can deal with them or, uh, they're throwing those people in detention, or there have also been cases where, uh, Rohingya have been returned to Myanmar, where they're then um, then detained. So uh, this this it's it's a real problem and it's something where there are solutions out there. Um, you just need the political will of the uh, the regional um, powers to uh, um, to tackle this. Hmm. Because this is the thing, like we've seen a lot of this. Like Australia has been uh, notable for the use of uh, what are called towbacks. Uh, they basically pull boats back out to sea and and hope that Indonesia deals with them. Um, we've seen a lot of people who who uh, tried to find refuge by boat uh, being effectively used as slave labor for extended periods of time because they obviously exist outside of the the scope of of legal protections. Um, and as you say, like we've recently seen, I believe it was Thailand uh, who returned uh, these refugees to to Myanmar, and I'm. The, it, it confuses me. I'm, I'm wondering whether you can shed light on this because it appears to me that these Rohingya meet every possible internationally recognized standard for genuinely fearing for their lives, genuinely facing persecution, and therefore would genuinely qualify having crossed an international border uh, for refugee protections. Is it is it lawful for countries to refuse to allow them to enter and to refuse to allow them to stay uh, to process a, a asylum application in a word no um i mean you you have it pretty clearly this is a group that's been targeted with genocide and uh the the group that was responsible for that genocide is uh is now has now taken over the country in a, in a coup um so yeah it absolutely um you know there's this this international concept of uh principle of non refoulement that uh you know it's it's um you know that no country should uh return uh, anyone to a, a place where they have a, a real credible fear of persecution and, and abuse. And that's, uh, I, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to see a, a, a more clear example of that than uh, with the Rohingya right now. So, I mean, that's, so that's uh, horrifying, but so the, okay, the big, this is the big lingering question right now, everything seems to be up in the air. Like the, the, the international community's pressures are probably, flying back and forth the western community is probably saying look the Rohingya have to be given asylum but the actual local community um you know malaysia thailand uh you know, vietnam bangladesh they're all responding to this quite differently things within myanmar are very volatile um if the nug succeeds and and god willing they will then there might be a pathway for Rohingya repatriation but there's no guarantee of that and the arakan army is is a an obstacle yet to be overcome they have not openly allied themselves either to the military or to the NUG, and uh, and there there are very legitimate concerns that even after a democratic victory, the Arakan army would not be um, welcoming of a resettlement program. So, the the big question that lingers is what is the way forward? Is is there light at the end of the tunnel? Do we have things that we can put into place to try and achieve uh, positive outcomes? Or is everything just up in the air and we're just hoping for the best? Yeah, there absolutely are things that we can be doing. Um, but you're absolutely right to say that even even if we can get past this part where, uh, which again, it's, it's not, uh, there's no clear path right now on how to create the conditions that would be safe and conducive to um, the voluntary return of Rohingya to, um, to Myanmar and, and those those words I just use are, are the, kind of the the definition guiding star for um, the UN Refugee Agency on what um, how returns should happen. You know that they should be um, voluntary um, and uh, uh, sustained. Um, 
And um, yeah, so there's there's no guarantee. Uh, or we don't know how we're going to get to that point. But even if we get to a point where the military is no longer directly in, in charge, um, yeah, you have that element of um, our, you know, the the, the Rakhine and in Archon, um, whether they would welcome them. They, as as you said, they've made some overtures. Um, and then you also have, even within the opposition, you know, like put the military aside, there are those who in the past have very publicly um, espoused uh, negative views of the Rohingya. So uh, I think one of the things that can be done now and that has been done is that um, it's um, it's been raised with the NUG and other opposition groups that uh, they need to be inclusive of, inclusive of the Rohingya. And we've seen public um, policy statements and positions um, out to that effect that they they do um, support the, the Rohingya that they support the uh, the case before the International Court of Justice. This is the you know that the NUG does, um, and so I think that's that's where it's really important. What can be done now is to make sure that um, the groups that would be uh, responsible for making sure that the Rohingya can return safely are that they make commitments now and that they're held to those commitments. Um, but that's you know that's later on. Uh, for now, it's uh, you know it starts with uh, just uh, continuing to rally international pressure and um, you know and, and uh, coordinating things like uh, targeted sanctions and um, you know pushing for arms embargoes and things like that to uh, to pressure the military um, and then finding ways to uh, support the opposition. Um, you know in uh, in, as, as, as was stated in the, the recent Burma Act passed in the U.S. in, in non-lethal ways. Um, so there's, there's a lot more that can and, and should be done in the near term, but uh, you're absolutely right to point out the fact that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be more, um, more barriers uh, even, even once you get past the, uh, the military obstacle, which is a huge one. Okay. And uh, so I... I... I promised this episode was going to be reasonably compact and, and fast paced and I'm conscious of your time. Uh, so I think we've covered quite a lot of bases here, but as, uh, as is our custom, I want to just leave us with any final thoughts that you might have, uh, something that you want the audience to, to mull over and consider, or just that, that key piece of information that you want them to keep in mind as they, as they go forward about their day. Yeah, thank you. Um, this has been a, a great discussion, and uh, you know, I, I think I just leave with uh, you know what what the, what the way forward is. Um, I, I think in on on basically three different levels. One is, um, you know, with this boat crisis that's going on, you need the immediate um, use of uh, search and rescue and safe disembarkation of uh, of people, and and uh, you know, guarantees or pressures from other countries uh, like the United States for those countries not to um, detain or send back Rohingya to um, this genocidal regime. Um, so that's the, you know, the first immediate thing. In the interim, you know, there, there needs to be continued humanitarian support for the Rohingya who are throughout the, you know, throughout the region and particularly in Bangladesh, but there are also Rohingya in um, Malaysia, um, some in, in Thailand and in India as well. Um, and then trying to find interim solutions. Uh, you know, I mentioned in Bangladesh, providing education and, and livelihood opportunities. There could be creative ways to work throughout the region to allow for exchanges, temporary work or education exchanges with Rohingya refugees. And then a small but very important part of it is uh, resettlement. We saw an opening at the end of last year of 2022, where Bangladesh, after many years, um, agreed uh, to resettle some Rohingya to the United States. And so those um, that's something that's that's ongoing. And again, it won't be a solution for the vast majority of people, but for those people who um, are resettled, it will be really important. And then the last thing is to, to continue to keep up the pressure on uh, on Myanmar, the global pressure and coordinate, coordination uh, to get at the root causes of this crisis so that eventually we will have that um, those conditions where um, they are conducive to a, a safe and voluntary return um, of the Rohingya uh, to their homeland, which is which continues to be what what the what um, pretty much every every Rohingya refugee I speak to um, their their ultimate goal. We'd like to take this time to thank our generous supporters who have already given. We simply could not continue to provide you with this content and information 
without the wonderful support of generous donors, listeners, and friends like you. Each episode helps in providing access to one more voice, one more perspective, one more insight. Every donation of any size is greatly appreciated and helps us continue this mission. We greatly appreciate your generosity, which allows us to maintain this platform. Thank you. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person, IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, Military Defection Campaigns, Undercover Journalists, Refugee Camps, Monasteries and Nunneries, Education Initiatives, the Purchasing of Protective Equipment and Medical Supplies, COVID Relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give in another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar, available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A L O K A C R A F T S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support. Oh, ba, yaranan, da, da, yaranan, ga, na, yaranan, ya, da, yaranan, ba, da, ba, yaranan.